having such terrible thoughts You'd say that it won't happen But you said you'd help and you haven't I've been cutting everyone off Get a head start on my Hey everyone, welcome to Apocalypse Here. What's up? Christianity you can live with. Nice. <laughs> I didn't know we were doing <laughs> we, that. We did not plan that. I'm glad you did that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Otherwise, this would that would have failed pretty miserably. But uh thank you all for for joining um <laughs> this live stream. Uh we've got a really special guest with us today. Yeah. Um but before we get started, um, to talk with him about um, the Bible, what is the Bible? Um, what do we mean when we are actually talking about the Bible? Um, I wanted to let you all know that we have a little uh, donation thing in our description. If you want to donate to our channel, which would, of course, help keep us going. keep going, <laughs> um, there's, there's a Venmo. Uh, link in the channel if you if you want to do that if you're like think if you're feeling very generous today <laughs> or you're really enjoying the show yeah if you really like it all three ahead. of you yeah all three yeah uh please do that but i'm going to bring in our guest for today amateur exegete hey what's up man not much what's up with y'all Good. Y'all probably know uh, Amateur Exegete from his blog and also his social media presence. Uh, but Ben, do you want to introduce yourself at all? Yeah, uh, my name is Ben. I go by the uh, Amateur Exegete. Um, like Laura said, I do a lot of uh, blogging um, on Twitter quite a bit. And uh, my focus basically is what my name is, Exegesis, and looking at biblical texts and trying to make sense of them. So. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. So I guess my first question as we sort of get into this is how did you get interested in doing amateur exegesis <laughs> to begin with? Like wh yeah. what is your sort of story? And maybe you can sort of get into your, your background. Yeah. So the Bible amateur is pretty obvious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not a professional, yeah. so it's, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, an amateur. Yeah. Uh, but I've, I've always, uh, I've, well, since I was really young, I had a, a love for the Bible. Um, I grew up as a King James only, uh, dispensational, premillennial, independent Baptist. And, uh, yeah, so heavy emphasis on reading the Bible. Um, our bulletin that we had at, the, at our church always emphasized 10 page, 10 chapters every day. Um, mm -hmm. and I would usually go above and beyond that just cause I, I love the book. And, mm -hmm. um, so I grew up loving the Bible. I had a, a dad who every morning woke up early and he read his Bible and he prayed. Uh, so I had that model in front of me continually. Uh, and that, it, you know, I, I got to, uh, um, got to college 
uh, started a major in evangelism. I wanted to become an itinerant preacher. Um, eventually, I got into youth ministry. So, you know, from about the age of, of, well, nine is when I accepted Christ as my Savior. I can remember that vividly. You know, up till even, I mean, now I'm an atheist, but, you know, after even after my deconversion, uh, I've had a deep love for uh, love for the Bible. Yeah. Um, it's just it's just stuck with me. So, why do you think that stuck around after you deconverted? Um. Well, there's probably two things. Uh, the first one is habit. <laughs> uh, it was just part of my life. Uh, you can't really get rid of it. You know, it's just it kind of hangs over you. It's part of you, but. Also, there's something about the the Bible. There's there's a beauty to it. There's a lot of horrible things in it. I mean, undoubtedly, but um, there's a quote in my profile for for Twitter. It's from Richard Elliot Friedman, and it says that one does not have to deny what is troubling to pay respect to what is heartening. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very true. I think there's so much about the Bible that is just beautiful. Just mm -hmm. there's just so much emotion to it. Um, you read the Psalms and you read the like David's Psalms of Lament, and just the the um, you can you can sympathize. You can you can feel what he's feeling, and I, I think that's beautiful. And I think that um, I think f for my community, the atheist community, we have this tendency to just dismiss it as yeah, myths yeah. and superstition. And um, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, not yeah, able yeah, to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I just don't think I think it's too far. Um, for sure, for sure. You know, it's a valuable book to read, and, and uh, well, we'll get into that, but yeah. So. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's, it's like, you know, it, I think it's the way a lot of classicists respond to Homer, for instance, right? That we mm -hmm. all know in, you know, the Odyssey, there's uh, some vestiges of a really troubling uh, outlook on life and some... Uh, some uh, moral ideas that we don't espouse, but it doesn't change the fact that there's a reason why these texts have hung around for as long as they have, and it's not mm -hmm. always because of wholehearted commitment to everything that's in it, but it's um, there's something that sticks around after the fact, right? So uh, yeah. that, that to me it makes a lot of sense, even though I I haven't deconverted, um, you know, I obviously am still a Christian, um, but but I I I hear. I really empathize with the way you respond to the text uh, because I think this is a this is a trait I see in myself in response to a lot of other ancient texts. So, mm -hmm. right, yeah, it's a good segue into um, kind of where I was wanting to go with mm -hmm. this. Um, so, at least when I think about the Bible, um, I think there are two very obvious ways in which we can think, like sort of initially answer the question, what is the Bible? First, <laughs> I think we can talk about it in terms of an ancient artifact mm -hmm. with sort of artifacts within it. Um, second, it is already in itself a religious book, right? You have tradition, mm -hmm. you have yeah. priests talked about in there, you have um, rituals, you have instructions, all sorts of things within the Bible that are sort of going on. It seems to be talking about a God or gods within it, right? So I, I like to sort of initially talk about it in terms of it's an ancient text and it's also fundamentally a religious text. Mm. So to kind of begin, um, how would you all comment on the ancientness, the oldness, the kind of foreignness of the Bible? Um, what does that mean? For ben, do you want to start? For yeah, so <laughs> um, I think anybody who comes to the Bible, except for maybe fundamentalists, when they approach it, they're going to notice very antiquated ideas that we just don't hold to anymore. Um, you look at the priestly laws in Leviticus, nobody does these rituals anymore. Um, uh, you know, some because they simply can't. Uh, the temple was destroyed now 2,000 years ago, so some of those rituals just can't be performed. But you know, we've we when you look at uh, when you look at those laws, you look at those those ordinances. They are from a time when um, almost a time of, of of myth, almost a time of when the world wasn't. We they just didn't make it just didn't make as much sense as it as, as it does now. Um, 
So I, I'm thinking of a so, so in Isaiah chapter 27, for example, um, it opens up with the uh, Isaiah talks about the twisting serpent, you know, the uh, Leviathan, and what most. Well, I wouldn't say most, but many, many, many readers don't realize is Leviathan is actually a, a carryover from Ugaritic myths, um, the Lotan, the Lytan of of the Baal epic. Um, but you don't get that just by reading only the Bible. You have to have this broader knowledge of the ancient Near East, especially uh, you know the Ugaritic myths, and it just opens it. But it also reveals that this is a time of of when people had these ideas of serpents lurking in the waters and um you know it, it's such a yeah, monster idea yeah yeah i mean it's 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 there's this no one comes to homer no one reads the iliad and thinks oh well this is about a, something that happened 20 years ago you read it and you you just you kind of feel how old it is you just there's a sense of just how weighty and ancient right. this is right and the bible has the same exact sense the yeah. same exact sense Yeah, no, no, that's a, that's a that's a feeling I'm very familiar with because I I actually feel like there's um, you know, it's not just the Bible but just ancient studies in general. You know, I'm I'm a PhD candidate at Duke. I do a lot of historical research, and I, I, I actually feel like there's a, there's there's often these moments of like sangfroid, almost where you have this sense of contact with someone who lived a very very long time ago but was still a person and there's this moment of empathy when you read about them and i i feel this often the most with inscriptions when you kind of catch somebody in a moment um in their lives when they wrote something down that mattered to them uh mm -hmm. so the, the time in my life i felt this the most intensely was pompeii uh mm -hmm. when i went to pompeii and was sort of seeing these you know these very uh like graphic relics of real human beings um in the last days of their lives uh, navigating this, but but the the other place I've recently felt this was um, reading about the inscriptions that uh, the Romans left for their dogs when they died at grave sites, and and this to me, you know, I'm I'm a huge sucker for animals. I am such a softy for for critters of all kinds. Uh, but looking at the inscriptions that Romans left for their dogs, and the fact that when they buried their dogs, they left these marks behind of what they named their dogs and what they loved about their dogs. You know, that, that to me, that's when you have that moment of that, that click of realizing that, you know, you can kind of like feel somebody across time. Mm, yeah. And that's something I feel a lot mm. when I read the Bible, there's this sense of connection that they're, they're distant, but in a way they're not that distant, but mm. not because we think the same way, but because we have the same feelings about the world as we go through it. And we sometimes share challenges. So I, I think that's to me, when, when I think about the Bible being from long ago and from a really distant place, it's, there's a lot of tension there, right? Because on one oh, yeah. hand, there's a lot of distance that, you know, I can't import the way I think into them and they can't import the way, and, and I can't take on the way they think into my own brain. Like I'm literally not capable of it. Uh, it's not something I can strive to do, but there's also, um, I think if, if you leave space for empathy and for connection, you can actually find more there than you think. Um, oh, yeah. not quite the same thing as taking, taking the Bible and reading it as a instruction manual that was written 20 minutes ago and yeah. you just adopt that on. And we'll, we'll get right. to that. Yeah. The, the nature yeah. of the instruction <laughs> is a lot more complex. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. The, the, the whole idea. So I, today I was, I've been working in uh, first Thessalonians mm -hmm. uh, for my podcast and I'm in first Thessalonians chapter uh, two and three. And there's this section in, at the end of chapter two where Paul, um, well, let me, let me read it to you um, because this is from my translation of it, but he says this in verse 19. For what is our hope and joy and crown of exaltation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? Mm -hmm. And in the Greek text, you know, this is a it's broken syntax. It's Paul begins this question and then he immediately interjects with this other one. But he does it because he's just so excited. He's just his his emotions are overwhelming, and he's just mm -hmm. I just he's like I really love you guys. You guys are amazing. I'm just so excited. Our, our, who, what is our crown or boasting? It's you. Yes, it's you. And he just he, 
the the affectionate. It, I get goosebumps just thinking about it. It's, yeah, it's, you just feel how how much he loves them, and any. I mean, you can't sympathize empathize with that. You know, you yeah. think about. You, I'm like, I have two kids that I love dearly. You know, and for Paul, Paul is talking to these Thessalonians as though he's their, their father, and he compares himself to a mother. He just loves them, and it just boils over in what he says, and it's just so it's just so human and so rich. I just I just love it. It just I know exactly you know. what you mean. I, 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 I know exactly what you mean, and that's it's what I love about history too. You know, it's yeah, it's just, really old, old, old history. We can find those things that that just still ring true. Yeah, so, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Um, so Ben, you've indicated. Uh, you've talked about the sort of historical stuff with the Bible. You've sort of hinted at the religious stuff, that there's stuff that people were doing, especially the Le Levitical stuff that was yeah. kind of updated now, which is true. Um, quite true. Uh, uh, what, it, what does it mean to think about the Bible as a religious book? Because there are rituals, there are mm -hmm. um, sacrifices going on, there are I mean, we have scribes and, and teachers and priests and all these sorts of characters in there. So what does it mean, do you think, for the Bible to be kind of a, a religious text? Yeah. So a lot, you know, yeah. it's, it's as an atheist, you don't, uh, the Bible has no religious value for me, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, no, no, no. Yeah. Not no, for but, you, but like in But you recognize, yeah. you know, it, for Christians, for, for Jews, you know, this, this, it's the text through which, at some at some level or another, God is speaking. Um, maybe not. Uh, I grew up thinking that the Bible was the literal word for word, you know, the King James Bible, and only the King James Bible um, was the word of God. But you know, people today who Christians and Jews who who really value the text feel in that that God is speaking in some way that. Um, he's laid out in some cases these rules and regulations. In other instances, it's not as, as stringent. But um, the whole point of this is communion with God. Mm -hmm. It's to enjoy fellowship with Him and with one another. Um, that's why, like the ritual of the Lord's Supper for Christians, it's a communal activity. It's meant to communicate a past event. But when you read Paul, the sense is you come to this event, you come to this ritual for the community to be one with all those around you. Um, it's an inherently religious activity, mm -hmm. um, but religion is always horizontal and vertical. It always is. Mm -hmm. There's always that horizontal element. Um, and so, you know, as an, as an atheist, I can, I can value that certainly because I can see just how rich the Bible can be to promote a sense of, of, uh, of unity among people of like-mindedness. Um, and it, and in many ways, it's it's a beautiful thing to see, um, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. No, that that makes a lot of sense. That the, the, there's this, you know, even if a text is not um, religiously significant for you, you know, I think this is something a lot of us can relate to with maybe texts from other traditions. You know, that you can see the the power of the rituals that are being described and yeah. like why that, why that particularly matters. Um, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, what? Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. Thank you, Ben. Um, so kind of where I want to go next. Um, <laughs> it's kind of looping back to the beginning a bit with the guiding question. Then, if someone were to come up to you in a coffee shop, let's say it's post COVID or pre COVID, yeah. whatever. Hey, I'm getting my, va my vaccine Thursday. I'll be good. I'll be good to go. Oh, yeah, yeah. ours. Yeah. Where is it? I our saw. <laughs> yeah. Very jealous. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, good. I'm, I'm really excited for you. That's terrific. Yeah. <laughs> Feels good. So, oh, yes, it does. Yeah, it's really uh, terrible. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were very sick the next yeah. day, but, uh, but now we're fine. Yeah. So. <laughs> Doesn't go for everyone. Yeah. But, I have that to look forward to. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, right. um, if someone were to kind of come up to you, and I don't know why, this is just hypothetical, <laughs> and be like, Ben, what is the Bible? What is it? 
Is he the host of the podcast? No, he's just a okay. he's just a right. dude. Okay. Um, <laughs> what's the Bible? How would you sort of respond to that initially? What would sort yeah. of be your answer to to that question? My answer used to be, and it probably still will be because I have a short memory, but it used to be the Bible's an anthology. But the more I've thought about that, the more I, I think that's a bad answer because an anthology implies maybe a single editor. A better answer would be what Paula Fredrickson writes. It's one little line in her book on Paul. Uh, she says the, 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 the Bible's a library. Yeah. yeah. It's just it's a, just a collection of ancient texts, various authors, disparate voices. They disagree you know, on certain things. They agree on others. Um, I'm reading right now Kristen Swenson's book that just came out last year on the Bible. It's a most peculiar book. And she talks about how the texts invite you to debate, not just with each other about them, but with the Bible itself. The Bible is an invitation, an invitation for discussion. And mm -hmm. so I think if, if somebody were to come up with, to me and ask that question, I would say it, the Bible is an invitation. It's mm -hmm. an invitation to have a conversation. Whether you believe in God or not, it makes no difference. It's a it's a con it's an invitation to it to a conversation about life, um, the universe, and everything. <laughs> to borrow <laughs> Douglas Adams, uh, you know. But that's just what it is. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, it's, not, not to be tautological about it, because like I feel like my initial response to that question is, uh, is I, I hope it doesn't bother you that I've fallen into a pattern of letting you talk and then I respond. I'm not trying to like correct you. <laughs> it's just like I. Just, like, <laughs> yeah, she is. No, it's more that I like. I like you, routine, so this is this is comforting yeah. to me. This is. <laughs> It's more that you say something, and then I get thinking about it, and then I want to say something about it. No, I mean, it's, not to be tautological about it, but I almost feel like the best answer to that is the Bible's a canon, right? You know, and just like whatever you think a canon is. Exactly, then yeah. that's the answer, right? You know, because mm -hmm. there's, there's all kinds of different canons, right? You know, there's the, the Star Wars, the Harry Potter canon, and <laughs> what you include in it might be a bit ragged based on when you were born, you know, because like I... Mm -hmm. Not to and also wrong based on your. Uh, <laughs> but but no, that, yeah. no, yeah, that my, my my canonical yeah, yeah as someone who was born in 1988, <laughs> my understanding of what's in the Star Wars canon is quite short compared to someone who yeah. was born in 1995, right? You know, because oh, yeah. I. I, I, I actually have like sort of a loose relationship with the prequels that like I understand they were made <laughs> for the same purpose, even though I don't really feel like they you were have, You right. have just alienated a whole bunch of your I audience. Know, <laughs> I know, I'm in hot water Commit here. To it. I'm in to hot it. water. But but or or to give a bit more of an obvious example, you know, again, born in nineteen eighty eight, like with Harry Potter, um, you know, when I was grown up and, you know, like the last Harry Potter came out when I was a senior in high school. So that was my, the end of my Harry Potter journey. And then uh, <laughs> years and years later, I think I was in grad school when it happened. Uh, JK Rowling, you know, would sort of update her blog with these things like, you know, oh, Ginny and Harry always had a terrible marriage. Or, you know, <laughs> or, or there's his son's a time traveler. You know, what we were wanting to know. Yeah, right, yeah. exactly. Which yeah, for me, yeah. like when I think about my memories of reading those books, yeah. I was not waiting, oh, then, you know, Harry got addicted to opioids, right? <laughs> you know, like I was never, like, I was never waiting for that payoff. But so, so I feel like, <laughs> where was I going with this? <laughs> my point was that, like, Idea of canon. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to cancel this. Um. <laughs> we're not gonna be able to monetize this at all. <laughs> no, but but all that is to say, you know, that our understanding of what a canon is can be quite shaky, right? Because like on one hand, let's say that you know if you think everything written by Rowling is canon, well then you have yeah. to take all that in. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, if it's just what you grew up with thinking of as authoritative that can be a lot narrower or broader depending on the situation. And I think the Bible can work in a really similar, to bring this all back around to some sort of educated position. You know, I think the Bible can 
be really similar, right? That, you know, practically when we say the Bible's canon, a lot of times what we don't just mean is the text themselves, but we mean yeah. like the text and their interpreters right. or like the text yeah, and the way right. we heard it preached. That's right. Um, or like, you know, where in the world you were when you were introduced to the Bible, your canon might be literally bigger or smaller than mine, um, but also includes these things after the fact. So it's just, yeah. you know, whatever you think a canon is, that's the answer. And that's, and that's a complicated question. It has everything to do with your situation and what you personally gravitate to. So, yeah. yeah. Definitely. I mean, growing up King James only, you know, <laughs> is so much different from growing up or from being an evangelical. It's just... Uh, yeah. You have this whole world of interpretation that you don't share with anybody else, but it's it's very real to you. It's very, you know, you believe these things. This is part of your. Now we won't. We wouldn't admit it because we were sola scriptura, you know. Uh, you know, but but yeah, you bring to the table so much surrounding that the book um, mm -hmm. that you just don't you don't readily acknowledge. Like you said, you just. Also, um, I am really glad I have never read J.K. Rowling's blog. So, <laughs> thank you for that warning. I will have to read it. Nuggets from Twitter here and there. You know, oh. for, I mean, of course, J.K. Rowling. <laughs> it's its own thing now. With you know. Oh yeah, she. Fans, yeah. but 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 long before that, there was you know how you interact with this world. It's very it's very George Lucasy. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Some very wild stuff. Yeah, I've learned uh, so much. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so let's let's talk about inerrancy oh. for a bit. Um, so I know you, Ben, came from a KJV only kind of background. Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming inerrancy was sort of a part of that. This was oh yes, sort of God yeah. that you have. Um, you can open it up. This is God's word. God said it, right? People wrote it down, but God was sort of really the one behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you describe what inerrancy was for you back then um, in, in that situation? And then, Laura, kind mm -hmm. of, if you could describe yeah. sort of inerrancy in your context. I'm assuming they're yeah. going to be a bit different, but um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, just yeah there's, there's just one thing I've realized is there's many different definitions of inerrancy. Um, yeah. Growing up, you know, it's not a helpful term, I think. It's yeah. terrible. So many people yeah. use it. Is oh, the, no, the they, they absolutely yeah. do. Yeah. But I think it's it's more you have to ask next question. So this is actually something I've this is a, a this is a lecture I've wanted to give on Apocalypse here for a really long time mm -hmm. of like, what is inerrancy? Uh, because, you know, as someone who went to an inerrantist school for my MA, you know, I had like queer affirming inerrantist friends and I had inerrantist friends who thought the earth was 6,000 years old. It was like, it, it can mean anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's yep. all the that, interpretation. Yeah, that, and, exactly, you know, yes. Probably yeah. when interesting. Right, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. The, her it's the hermeneutic that is supposed to is, well, is I mean, really inerrant, you know? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. It, it's absolutely is hermeneutic. Yeah. It's, exactly. it's an approach yeah. you take yeah. to a text. Yeah. And then at that point, it's yeah. open season. But it's, yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, for us, it was, yeah. um, and again, it's being, growing up King James only was such a unique experience because our particular brand, <laughs> our particular, so. Let me just give you an example. So there's a passage in the book of Acts where it says um, uh, they're at Ephesus. Peter's in Ephesus. I think it, or Paul, Paul's in Ephesus. And mm -hmm. uh, the there's a like a town clerk or somebody who says that uh, he's, he's defending Paul and his companions against the, the rioters. And he says that, you know, these guys aren't in the King James. Th these aren't robbers of churches or of mm. I forget what else. So the King James says robbers of churches. The Greek text says robbers of temples. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so our the guru that we followed in the King James only movement was Peter Ruckman. <laughs> Peter Ruckman said that the King James text, even though the Texas Receptus said temple robbers, the King James Bible was so advanced and so inspired by God that it corrected the Greek text and yeah. fixed it. Because it was advanced knowledge about people in the future who would want to rob the church. 
and steal Whoa. from it, yes yeah so <laughs> he makes this argument in uh, his book manuscript evidence and i read that when i was really young. i was probably 17 i was hooked on peter ruckman i met the guy i have so this is can you see this way to do with me. yeah for sure yeah so th this is this is my my wide margin schofield reference bible oh, okay. that i got what that I got my senior year of high school. I went down to Pensacola. Oh, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I met Peter Ruckman and and I got his I got a signature right here. Good. Uh, right there is Peter Ruckman's signature. I mean, I was hooked on the guy. Yeah. Um, but inerrancy for us was just the the whatever the King James Bible said was true. Yeah, right. It, it yeah. was it's word word. not just the text, but it's interpreters. Yeah, so it was yeah. it was Young Earth creation. Um, you know, it was, there was advanced scientific knowledge in the Bible, um, anything like that. Yeah. 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 I mean, I it was, it was you know, standard fundamental is fair, but it was with yeah. a King James only twist. Yeah. I remember yeah. getting that line at a fairly young age about, there's a Psalm, I can't remember which one it is about God sitting over the circle of the earth and all men. Oh, Isaiah, the Isaiah earth. chapter 40. Yep. Oh, is that Isaiah? It's, yeah. It's yeah. 40, yeah. And yeah. I remember yeah. being told, it's like, oh, it shows here that the Bible knows that the earth is a sphere. Yep. And my little 12 year old Laura was already sitting there going, sphere's not the same thing as a circle. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't there. <laughs> not me, not this guy. I would not have thought that. I was like, oh, yeah, Circle of the Earth? Oh, man. That, the oh, Earth is right, and, and they knew it. Right. <laughs> No, but 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 that's the thing. It's like then then you get a little bit older and you start reading about ancient cosmon cosmologies. Um, yeah, and it, you know, and the 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 hand holding into the deep end of the pool on this front for me was mm. absolutely John Walton. You know, yeah, who was yeah, very right. comfortable with yeah. you know because I I actually never did the younger thing. I was always not. I couldn't do it. Um, You've missed out on I, so much. <laughs> But I, but I needed, I needed. Did you though? <laughs> Did you miss out? Buddy? But I, I, I needed, um, I needed permission to not do it. That's this is what my sister and I were actually just talking about today. Is for all the things we never believed in evangelicalism, it's not because we were just so savvy and we just like overcame it. It was just yeah. like there was just. Hmm. There was a block. We just couldn't do it. Yeah. And um and then for me, a huge part of like my spiritual journey has been um meeting people who gave me the permission to not believe that. Uh and very specifically to be do that and still be Christian, uh, which has been huge for me. Because if those people yeah. exist, I I don't know where I'd be now, you know. Um I I like to think I would have just not believed any of that stuff yeah. but I, I don't know uh so but that was really huge for me um so so yeah i think about that like advanced scientific knowledge i remember having that stuff like kind of pawned off on me when i was a child and just not buying it so um you know well, yeah. I, I mean yeah it's it's you well, you're familiar with ray comfort right I know the name. I couldn't. Yeah, tell you. So, he's, the, he's the banana guy, right? The banana, yeah. Him and Kirk Cameron, right? And he wrote a book called uh, "Scientific Facts in the Bible." And uh, I've been doing a series called "Invasion of the Bible Snatchers" in the blog that has this right now taking apart some of his arguments. And yeah. also, just for, everyone who's everyone who's just for everyone who's watching, your blog is is linked in the description of this uh, video. Oh, good. So everyone knows. So, yeah. Good, yeah, but you know he he in that book he lists all these, and it's a short little book, but he lists all these advanced scientific, all this advanced scientific knowledge the Bible had, but it's all it's always taken out of context, and it's always at the expense of, of what the ancient author was actually trying to communicate, and it, and it just it just ruins it. I mean, just violence of the text. It exactly, just, it's just it. yeah, just chopping it up, and I, I just it bothers me, and and let me just say this because I'm harping on bad Christian readings. Atheists do the same exact thing. Yep. So, <laughs> yes, they and do. Let me, if I may, let me just give you an example. It's not about science, but there was a meme, and I always hate to bring up memes, but this is a good one, that complained that the Bible mentions the word unicorn, but never mentions cats. And people were sharing this meme as if it was some astute observation. And and so I, I wrote a blog post on it, but I the the, the, the 
that I had to do so just irritates me still because yeah. if you think about, first of all, I mean, they know cats. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. and even if they did, what is it? Do they have to mention every animal that ever existed? I mean, Chickens. Oh. Chickens aren't in yeah. the Bible. You know? I mean, I mean, the Bible does mention dinosaurs, though. We know that, right, from the Book of Job. So oh, yeah. no, uh, that's true. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But I mean, but the atheists are just as guilty. So I mean, I, I feel like I'm harping on Christians too much, but my own team has a tendency to do that. No, but, but, but then, yeah. No, I was going to ask you. So, so my definition of inerrancy was the Bible's perfect, word for word, yeah. advanced science. Laura. You, you, since you didn't grow up quite in that fundamentalist camp, what yeah. was inerrancy to you? Um, well, it meant it meant a lot of things actually. Um, because I my 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 grandmother was sort of my primary religious teacher for a lot of my childhood. She was our Sunday school leader. Um, I went to a really rural sort of farming uh, Quaker church until I was a young teenager. So most of my early Bible knowledge was from my grandmother, who was both. Huh completely prodigious in scope. Uh, like my, my grandmother taught me dude, poker, but okay. Sorry? <laughs> so my grandmother taught me how to play poker and that, that's all I learned. <laughs> yeah, those are we so can't all have winners. <laughs> are, yeah. I guess I guess we're the same. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Much more important skills than knowing the Bible. Um, no, so. but 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 it's funny because my my grandmother was not a fundamentalist by any stretch of the imagination. She was not in the um, she she was not an aesthetic. Uh, she had a lot of fun. She was extremely creative, um, but she was she was an inerrantist. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I actually feel like if there's one conversation I regret not having with my grandma before she died, it's what that meant to her. Uh, because she studied the Bible con consistently and read it all the time. But I also, you know, I, I think we, we put off a lot of conversations to the, we'll talk about it when you're older, though, mm -hmm. um, because my... You know, because you know, my grandmother was a very firm believer that women could be ordained, for instance, right? Like we had uh, female ministers in our church, and um, my grandmother was very involved in the um, in the civil rights movement in 1960s rural Indiana. Wow! So a lot of the traits that we normally associate with um, like conservative fundamentalists. Uh, were not true of my grandmother at all. And also she found um, purpose and intention to do that through her inerrantist reading of scripture. And I don't really know how she did that. Uh, hmm. I, I, I mean, if I think about it, you know, I know there's a lot of models in the American Christian tradition that there's yeah. like liberationist traditions and there's... Um, so I, I think that when I was a kid, it was very much that like the Bible was true, and if you hit the Bible saying something that's not true, you just you're gonna have to read it a few more times, right? Yeah. You know? I think that was very much how we dealt with things like women's rights. You yeah, that's just like well, that. It cannot possibly mean that women can't be pastors because they're Sue preaching right now. <laughs> so we just, <laughs> we just gotta squint at this a few more times. And, and honestly, if that was the only version of inerrancy I was ever introduced to, I would have an inerrantist tattooed on my bicep right now. <laughs> you know, it's that's like, pretty good. That's a pretty good view. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just rock and roll, let's do it. And, mm -hmm. um, but then I, I, I moved into more, um, when I was a teenager, we ended up in more um, sort of, I think what people envision when they think of like big white mega church evangelical spaces. Uh, and then it did get way more complicated, right? Because then we did have um, a church that didn't let women speak um, from the front in the sanctuary. And we did have a very strong um, concept of, uh, you know, female submission to men, which my parents just ignored. And I figured, <laughs> I figured my sister and I would figure out on our own. Uh, we did not, but that was cool. They thought that. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and, and a lot of that, what we think of is sort of the baggage of inerrancy. That, that wasn't something I really interacted with until I was quite a bit older. Um, so, so I think from my perspective, and then, you know, I went on to get my master's at Wheaton in biblical exegesis, which is an explicitly inerrantist school. Yeah. So when I think about inerrancy, 
I, I really, I don't even have like a sense of what the, um, what the coloring of the word is. Like I've been to in such wildly different spaces where everyone there thinks of themselves as an inheritance. So <laughs> yeah. it, it just, it, you know, this is what, this is why I say that like, it's a, it's a hermeneutic. Um, exactly. Yeah. Like this is this is an interpretive assumption you take with you into the text that doesn't necessarily shape your interpretation, except that you have to read with the text. And if that means you have to get this passage that says women can't be pastors to say women can be pastors, then you do it. <laughs> and, like, that's all there is to it. And yeah. So I I don't know. And I um, yeah. It's it's a funny it's a funny thing. And I, I'm such a weird mutt that way. But that's. <laughs> I guess that's how I think about it mm. with my influences. But no, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, given your up your upbringing. Yeah, Aaron asked, um, "Has my family moved away with evangelicalism along with me?" Um, I, my sister and I kind of, you know, we always have a bit of a one foot in, one foot out. There's, there is stuff in the evangelical tradition I still really do love and admire, um, even if I would probably not be at home in most large evangelical churches uh, in the United States. Um, my parents, no, not really. No, they're still very much in it, even though, as I say, they're. It, it's hard to call them products of the evangelical church just because their response to it is so shaped by having not grown up in that environment. So, you know. I mean, I, I think like uh, unlike a lot of people with evangelical parents, uh, my mom and dad think it's pretty awesome that I'm a Bible teacher. And I think that a lot of women with evangelical parents would not have that experience. Uh, my mom and dad listen to the New Testament Review podcast and they love it. So that's uh, not something you would normally expect from a narratist, I think, but you know, just depends. So. Sure. But, yeah. Okay. I, I don't think Ian's parents love New Testament Review. <laughs> <laughs> but mine too. <laughs> so. We're gonna bring some folks yeah. in, if you don't mind, Ben. No, go right ahead. Yeah. Yes. Hey. Hi, Avi. Hey. Hi, guys. Did you see the owl I showed you? I have not been on Twitter in a month. Oh my god. Um, I actually like. I changed the email on it, and I changed the password on it, so I have to ask my wife. To to send me my password, um, because it was it was getting terrible. Yeah, no, good man. Uh, well, I crocheted an owl. Do you want to see him? I do. Okay, hang on a second. Avi <laughs> <laughs> um... asked if I could make owls, so I made an owl. But, uh... <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know if I know who you are. Well, I can tell you who I am. Ben knows who I am. Oh yeah. Uh, can't believe you let him this well, guy. That's amazing. That's <laughs> Should I not have? Should I block him now? Um, no. <laughs> um, yeah, first of all, uh, let me start with some pleasantries. Uh, John and Laura, thanks for doing the stream. This is really great. Oh, yeah, you bet, man. Uh, Laura, big fan of NT Review. Hi. Uh, ben. I'm being really the, ridiculous. Sorry. Big fan of yours. I have an yeah. owl. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got some thoughts I'd like to share. I'm sure Ben knows what I'm going to say, but um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll just get into it if that's all right. Um, yeah, go for it, man. Yeah, I mean, you know, this the title of, of this stream was really what drew me here. What is the Bible? And, and to me, uh, my thing is that I think it's political propaganda. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I've reached this conclusion through my methodology of mere reading, which... Uh, you know, I'm happy to talk more about that if you want me to, but just through that, discovering uh, that the Bible is really uh, the authors were trying to consolidate political power. They were injecting, uh, you know, people into genetic lines. They were injecting tribes into uh, into nations. They were making failed prophets, uh, successful prophets, and um, you know. So to say that the Bible is fundamentally a religious text, I would say, no, it's not. It is propaganda that is masquerading as a religious text. Um, now, let me qualify that a little bit. Uh, I wouldn't say that's so much the case in the New Testament. Um, 
you know, I think I haven't really near read in depth that much in the New Testament, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, from what I've, I have done, I, I, it seems that Paul is pretty legit. Like he really believes what he's saying. Uh, the Gospels, not so much. There's, a, a, I think there is some fabrication there. Um, but, uh, you know, the problem is that this, the New Testament is, is built on the Old Testament in a sense, and the Old Testament is uh, largely, if not all, political propaganda, in my opinion. So uh, I'm not trying to start a fight. It's just I <laughs> wanted to share my perspective, and, and that's, that's my perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, I I just had an article come out in New Testament Studies about Paul and sort of the over the overly politicized reading of Paul that uh, kind of drives me bonkers. So this is the this is the perspective I'm taking into this. Of course, I do New Testament, not Old Testament, quite as much. Um, I think sometimes the role of politics in the New Testament is very much overplayed. Um, so, you know, you're already starting from a movement that is not politically significant by any stretch of the imagination. You know, you're talking about a wildly underclass movement uh, that's very small and does not have um, meaningful access to political levers. And I think that because of this, the movement itself is quite quietist, that there's not a lot of interest in trying to overturn major social uh, institutions, which I think is fairly obvious when you look at Paul's letters, that Paul yeah. is not really interested in any kind of major social change. He's trying to deal with the the situation that's six inches in front of his face. So um, a couple of years ago, I was in a Paul seminar where I met this guy, and uh, and now we're married. And uh, but I was getting driven crazy by the extent to which a lot of times. Uh, we were trying to extrapolate from Paul's letters into larger political points. So the, the main avenue in which this has happened in Pauline scholarship is the whole idea of hidden transcripts. The idea that Paul is using political language and political motifs to encode messages about his bigger understanding of the Greco-Roman world into his letters. Now, why is Paul coding? Why is he being so uh, abstract about this? Well, it's because this movement is so small and so impoverished that if anyone knew what they were really talking about, then they'd all be in seriously <laughs> trouble. If you yeah. look at it for a second, it makes no sense, right? That the idea that the Greco-Roman world had the capacity to um, be sort of checking in on what people thought about that. It's not a police thing. Right, yeah. No, exactly. The, the idea that Caesar had the capacity to sort of like check in, see how everyone was feeling about him, you know, like see how his uh, his approval ratings were doing, and then ask folks who weren't getting on, on board at the program. It, it, it falls apart once you start looking at it. So I, I, I think I, I take that starting point as a really important tool for reading Paul and the political world. Um, that I think the reality is that Paul doesn't talk about politics, not because he is fine with the way things are, but because it is just so many layers above his ability to influence and engage with that it's just not even on the ground. Um, if anyone wants to read that, that was in the last issue of New Testament Studies. Um, but I, I should have provided the link, but I didn't know we were going to I can find it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I think it's so. So I think it's it's tough, right? Because on one hand, in the Old Testament, you do have people talking about things like kingdoms and uh, you know, and nation states, and sort of rebuilding this national mythology from a place of uh, of exile and destruction. Uh, but then you move a little bit further in the network, I, I, I mean, in the chain of events, and you get into the New Testament, and just the landscape is so different. So I, I think that's important, um, but yeah. No. So I'm, I'm posting that. Uh, in the... yeah, so. yeah, I would, you yeah, know, I would agree with a lot of what you said there, Laura. <laughs> yeah. um, so you were more concerned with the OT. Yeah. yeah. I haven't. I mean, yeah. only because that's yeah. all, you know, I haven't, I haven't gotten to the New Testament yet. Um, yeah. But um, I'm waiting. But, yeah, right. Thessalonians is is on the is on the docket, but uh, still, I'm on year two of Amos, so uh, <laughs> as I'm trying to figure, you know, trying to finish that up. But um, yeah, you know, in, in terms of Paul, I don't think there's that much political 
uh, connection there. Although I, I don't know if you guys ever saw the uh, documentary uh, "A Polite Bribe," I thought it was kind of yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you, yeah, yeah if you guys have thoughts, and if any seen, seen that, I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts. But if you haven't seen it, it's it's basically it talks about Paul, um, kind of. If I remember, I'll probably get this, you know, screwed up. But it's it's Paul is m kind of manipulative, trying to get the Gentiles to give money so that he can, you know, he can get in good with with the, the Jewish side of the church. Um, so, if somebody else has a better description than that, feel free to do that. But I I thought it was kind of interesting. I didn't really do in depth study of of the background of that documentary but um yeah if anybody has any thoughts i'd be ha happy to hear them yeah, there's a, definitely, I, don't, yeah. I don't have many things to say i i i've watched that i've watched polite bribe who's behind um, it because my my mentor doug campbell actually makes an appearance in that oh no way um oh. daniel <laughs> Briarin makes an appearance in that um Briarin briefly um yeah. yeah i don't know if they actually thought what they were involved with uh, no, no, it was one of those. <laughs> so, uh, I think it's. Yeah, I don't think it's actually quite getting at what Paul is doing. My read of that was sense, always a bit more eschatological. Yeah. That Paul is thinking in terms of the um, the tribute to the Gentiles at the end of Isaiah. That Paul is kind of trying to enact. In that. terms of the collection. Yeah, that was kind of my. That was always my read of what was going on there. Yeah, I mean it's that. Yeah. Paul is kind of seeing himself as taking a collection from among the Gentiles. This could, so yeah, sort of I mean, this could take this. forever to sort of sort through what yeah. Paul is actually doing with the collection, because it's it's quite contentious in Pauline studies, mm -hmm. which I'm I've been involved with quite a bit for mm -hmm. a while now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I I don't quite buy what that <laughs> what that movie or documentary or whatever you want to call it is doing um i yeah i worry about that a little bit in terms of its claims and commitments in paul um does it, the movie yeah. take a stand on whether or not jerusalem accepted it the jerusalem church accepted yeah. the collection yeah i don't remember i don't recall that, either yeah because that seems contested in my experience I mean, we too. Don't yeah we don't know what happened no. yeah yeah evidence of that <laughs> we don't hear from paul one way or another anyway uh, yeah. <laughs> uh ethan spartan theology is here samuel Watkinson is here hi guys two buddies how's it going guys good good yeah i felt good. like I, I had something to say maybe but then it took a quick turn somewhere i wasn't expecting <laughs> so yeah i'm a little like trying to just listen there for a minute how's trish ethan She's doing all right. Yeah, my wife's. We're about to have twins, and she was spent the night in the hospital last night. Actually. Oh no! I'm she's sorry home. to hear that. Yeah, she's home right now. She's oh, home okay. Now. Good. Good. So, good. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. We're praying for you, man. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Samuel, how are you doing, man? Not too bad. A little bit sick, actually, but um. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Home. Yeah. Not bad. At least you're safe and healthy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do I, sorry? No, not Please COVID. Please receive COVID. COVID. <laughs> no. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. I don't know where to go from here. Do you want to... <laughs> anyone who joined in... We can all just look at each other. Yeah, we can <laughs> look at each other. Avi, do you have anything you want to say? Come Avi, on. do something! <laughs> I have a thousand things I could possibly say. I've been saving I them up. I have okay. a list. You always do, man. Yeah. Um, no, I, I actually, so the, the thing that I did want to talk about for a second is I wanted to go back to the inerrancy conversation. So, oh, sure. in, um, so I'm, I'm Jewish. Um, and it's like, there is, we don't use that language to talk about mm -hmm. the Bible at all, but there's all, there is also a very, strong important dogma about the torahs from heaven the torah was given at sinai um mm -hmm. just like just to be clear what one of the things that i think 
Christians and Christian influence readers don't make a distinction about that traditional Judaism does is there's a difference between the five books of Moses and the rest of the Bible. The five books of Moses, traditional Judaism insists, is given word, God's word to Moses' hand. Mm -hmm. Stenographic revelation on Sinai, maybe in the desert, but no divine inspiration thing, no, okay. this is yeah. a little bit more complicated, but whatever. This is the dogma. The other things, divine inspiration, God's teaching, but they don't have that same quality. And mm -hmm. they also don't have normative weight. Um, mm -hmm. But it's like, they're sometimes like, even <laughs> academic scholars will slip and say, of course, just like the Bible, just like the Torah was given by God directly to Moses, the rest of the Bible was also given by God directly to prophets. Mm -hmm. um, and like obviously biblical criticism makes this difficult for Jews to uphold because it sounds like that's impossible if we accept some, if some version of, of uh, source criticism is correct and there's different texts written at different times, then how can it be that it was one text given at one time? Um, mm -hmm. And it's just, it's, I just wanted to reflect on that. There is a, that there's a parallel conversation going on with people struggling with these ideas. And it's interesting to me how much is similar in that it's, as Ben put it, it's, well, God said these words and human, humans wrote them down. And was, in some sense, it's not. That a lot of people who can really believe 100% God spoke these words to Moses and Moses wrote them down, can also believe, of course, the creation didn't happen in six days. Of course, the world isn't 6,000 years old. It's 13 billion years old, or it's the universe is 13 billion years old. And we have to understand those differently. Um, and that that's also not a 21st century thing. That's a 12th century thing. Yeah, that Maimonides sure. writes that, well, if I absolutely were convinced that it was correct philosophically, that the world wasn't created and that the world is eternal, I would have to reread the text in some other way. So if it mm -hmm. had to be true on this one, like the text has to be right according to what I know is right. Mm -hmm. um, and I really just wanted to share that because it's something that I've had in the back of my mind since um, I met my very close SBC friend, John, who told me about biblical inerrancy and this very important thing that it has to be true Mm -hmm. And it's so familiar and yet very different. It's like, what's not important is that it's true. What's important is that it came from heaven word for word. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Are there, um, are, are there strata of Judaism, uh, uh, are there different strata of Judaism that are more um, amenable to interpretive flexibility than others, Avi? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So no. when I say traditional Judaism, I am already using a loaded term because I'm not saying Orthodox Judaism. Mm -hmm. right. So orthodoxy um, since the 19th century is, and especially recently because liberal movements have locked on to biblical criticism as part of what they do. Um, mm -hmm. That So what's a major dividing line, and there's some slippage now, and Mark Shapiro had an article in Modern Judaism, I think last year about some slippage along the left edge of orthodoxy where I live, of mm -hmm. whether it's acceptable to maybe say not so much that the Torah came from heaven in exactly this way. Um, so it's become a very important dogma. Um, mm -hmm. Reform Judaism, obviously, since its inception in the 19th century, has always been comfortable saying, these are human words. Mm -hmm. um, and these, <laughs> like, we don't even do this. Conservative Judaism, there's a famous statement um, from Solomon Schechter, who was the f second president of the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, um, which called higher criticism, meaning the criticism of the Bible, source criticism, um, the higher anti-Semitism, that it's just a way of attacking Judaism by saying this is fake and this is political stuff that people um, just completely made up. Um, hmm. But by, and they, there was some discomfort at the seminary for the first few decades uh, teaching, biblical teaching biblical criticism. And the same issue came up at the Hebrew University when it was founded, I think in the 20s, in Jerusalem, of whether they were going to teach biblical criticism there or not. Eventually, of course, they did. Um, and some of the leading scholars of Bible at the Hebrew University were nominally orthodox. Nominally orthodox. Mayor Weiss, um, who wrote a book called The Bible from Within, which is on holistic interpretation of the Bible, and um, Isaac Leo Seligman, who wrote on Septuagint Isaiah and early Midrash in the Septuagint and in Chronicles, I think, um, were both like 
Orthodox Jews completely committed to critical method. Um, mm -hmm. And Yair Zakovich talks about like some of the jokes that went around. Yair Zakovich is an another uh, important scholar of the Bible who's completely secular in Israel, but trained with these two Orthodox scholars. In any event, um, so conservative Judaism has now sort of really integrated into itself this problem and ways of dealing with it, that it's like we think they've sort of moved the model of divine inspiration back onto the five books. They say these are divinely inspired human authors and the words are not directly from God. They're still really important. And the law is still normative, mm -hmm. according to the, in, according to that particular movement's interpretive tradition. Mm -hmm. um, the important people to mention here, I think, are Neil Gilman. No, I can't be getting that right. I can't believe he wrote the the book is Sacred Fragments, but he wrote a book I think in the eighties, which you can tell from the title is picking up the pieces of traditional Jewish theology, the fragments of mm -hmm. it, and what do we do with it? And one of the things that he really runs with is the idea that we just have to accept that um, the document hypothesis is true, higher criticism is a thing, and now we need to go forward and think about what do we do with these texts. Um, mm -hmm. Differently, um, Ben Summer, who's a student of Michael Fishbane and who now teaches at the seminary, Neil Gilman, thank you. Um, Neil Gilman died only a few years ago. Um, wrote a book, uh, Revelation and Authority, which is partly um, just a treatment of the stories of the Sinai Revelation, um, mm -hmm. but more importantly is a theological work on how Jews should think about the fact that there are not only multiple voices within the five books of Moses, but also multiple approaches to what actually happened in the Revelation at Sinai. Um, mm -hmm. So to me, it's not really compelling, but it's a, I think, richer version of this than what Gilman was doing. That it's, it is saying, not only is this true and we have to pick up the pieces, it's these are real voices, these are real human Jewish voices from the ancient Israelite past speaking to us, teaching us Torah. Um, and what exactly that means normatively for him, he waffles on at the end. Um, he's fully within the conservative Jewish normative tradition, which is for the most part traditional and has really important changes around egalitarianism, about um, around more recently sexuality, um, but where he thinks that his theology impacts halakha, where he thinks his theology impacts normative tradition, he doesn't really say so clearly. Yeah, yeah, hmm. that was a lot, sorry. Thanks, yeah. No, yeah. That's great. That, that um, also that yeah. also I think plays in really nicely to what Ben is talking earlier yeah, about. Definitely, sort of definitely. especially with like dueling fundamentalisms, I think, is one way in which this conversation often plays out yeah. online in not necessarily academic spaces, where it's sort of this, you know well, the text says this, so either it's true or it's false. And then, you know, of course, when you expand it out and talk about interpretive history, um, there's a lot more going on there, you know? Like, it's not necessarily true that everyone who has this attachment to the book of Genesis coming from heaven, uh, that doesn't always lead necessarily to belief in a worldwide global flood. Like, that's not the same thing. So I, I think that's always worth talking about, that there's more than one way to... Um, yeah. Well, and you know, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. the 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 fundamentalist movement, especially the one that I grew up in, you know, really originated back at the turn of the twentieth century, when mm -hmm. men like R. A. Tory um, uh, and other conservative scholars were reacting to the higher criticism coming out of Germany, mm -hmm. and even to like Darwin's theory of evolution. They produced this volume called The Fundamentals, and it really kind of push forward this this very conservative view of the Bible and of biblical history um, you know so and it, and it of course continues to this day but there is there's still shifts where st you know you still see the shifts in thinking especially on inerrancy inspiration um, this this RA Tory would be is rolling in his grave um, right now uh, just because of the, the the liberal shift you know but uh, I think we forget Christianity had its own reactionary mo moment a uh, hundred years ago, and uh, it produced some of my closest fr <laughs> closest friends to this day. Um, yeah. Sadly, <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. 
Spartans or Samuel? Do you want to? Yeah. yeah. Can I say one thing? Yeah, um, in it. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Just quickly, quickly say one thing. Um, what you said, RV, remind. Oh, you mentioned Benjamin Summers' book, Revelation and Authority. I think. Um, that um, reminds me of um, um, a collection to which Peter Enns, one of my uh, favorite scholars, contributed to um, a few years ago called The Bible and the Believer. Um, it, it's, it's a book which is written by Peter Enns, who's a Protestant sort of, you know, liberal, I guess, scholar. Um, David, Daniel Harrington, who's a Catholic scholar um and mark Brittler, who's a jewish scholar i, I think he's not he sure what... yeah. sorry oh mark Brittler isn't due i've guy. i've taught under him a few times yeah so oh i see so i didn't know where he was recently okay interesting yeah um yeah i just mentioned that because um well it's it's a good example of the the way in which um uh biblical criticism and um what you know um scholars think is scholars having a living faith or like a um some kind of religious commitment or whatever you know um how they can maintain both of them at the same time and um um i i have i have some questions i i read that a few years ago now i'd love to reread it but i have like some questions about like, like whether this attitude of like having two separate mindsets, you know, you have a, you're the, you're the critical biblical scholar, you know, as one, you're one hat you wear or whatever. And then you, you, you know, and then on the weekend you're, or, or you know, in your <laughs> private life, you're, you're sort of a, a religious believer or, you know, whatever, whether that kind of cup compartmentalization um, is actually the right, um, uh, what am I trying to say? Like, whether that buys too much into um, what you could call broadly like secular modernity, which I find problematic in many ways. Um, but um, anyway, that's another whole <laughs> big topic. Um, no, but, I want to um, pick that up. Okay, you can pick that up. Okay. If you want. Yeah. Okay, so um, Louis Jacobs, who was a real yeah. important Anglo-Jewish rabbi in the for most of the 20th century. Um, and was going to be chief rabbi, uh, except that he wrote a book where he basically says, I think that biblical criticism must be true. And people realize this and say, we can't have this. <laughs> and so he got sort of shoved off to the side. He ended up founding the British version of conservative Judaism. Um, but one of the things that mm -hmm. he writes very strongly about is that he thinks you really can't do this. You can't, mm -hmm. like, how could it possibly be that you could like say on Monday, oh, the Septuagint version of the text is actually better, and then say on Saturday, we're going to read the Masoretic text because that's given by God. Yeah. Um, and he just thinks it's not. And he's very, very sharply polemical. And it's like, okay, I get it. It's there. On the other hand, I, so it's like, I, I, I just, I think in references. So it's like, I'm, I'm mirroring what you say and say, yes, it's there. It's a problem. I don't feel like it's as much of a problem. So Mordechai Breuer, um, who's an Israeli rabbi, who came, who's an Israeli Orthodox rabbi, came up with a different approach, uh, which is called the Shitata Bechinot, the theory of aspects. And he says, look, you have to be the biggest kofer, you have to be the biggest heretic when it comes to reading the text properly, because there are real literary problems. They're there. What are those documents? Those are different things that God said. Those all come from heaven, and they came to Moses at Sinai because I approach this. Once I take off my my heretic hat and I put on my believer hat, we're outside of the realm of science. We're outside of the realm of empiricism. We're outside of all of those issues, and I have to read this using these other glasses. And I think like there's something in that that it's like it's just a different epistemology. Um, He's in yeah, the right. of the yeah. living God, yeah. yeah but... right. um, and it's like and I have to integrate them somehow that I personally find really compelling. And it doesn't bother me to say these are different epistemological approaches. These, and it's just, these are just different assumptions about how the text could possibly work. 
Yeah. Um, I, I have to say, Avi, I think my experience as a historical critic and a historian and a Christian is actually quite similar to that. <laughs> that like when you have these sort of like pluriformities of text and pluriformities of meanings, that I don't, I don't feel like I change years when I study them. I just feel like my spiritual understanding of these texts uh, just it finds new ways to accommodate this. Uh, I, I I really do think like yeah the the, the epistemological different changes are different. Yeah. Although I don't think that's what Samuel was indicating. Okay. If Samuel, yeah. I don't know if you want to pick back up on that. I'm not. Yeah. I don't know if. Yeah, I'll just add one thing. Um, what I was trying to say was that, um, or at least for me personally, I, I I don't I don't find this compartmentalizing um, attitude actually um, that helpful in the end. So like, it, it can solve issues methodologically, you know, um, you know, you know, in a similar way to you know how Stephen Jay Gould spoke, spoke of non-overlapping magisteria, you know, how science and religion are not in intrinsic conflict, but they can be independent spheres of teaching, by right, teaching authority. In a similar way, um, um, I, I think that um, with, when it comes to like um, uh, history and theology or biblical criticism and um, religious faith, um, this, this attitude of compartmentalizing um, solves issues in the short term, but in the long term, you know, you think of, and from a broader perspective, it, um, it doesn't really solve the the, um, the core issue, which I see to be simply that um, uh, the relation between faith and reason and modernity in the last like few hundred years has been as one of conflict rather than rather than harmony. You know, faith and reason are not um, so basically they've been redefined those two terms. You know, so like in in pre-modernity, just to speak in broad terms now. Um, the um uh you know um like for one belief didn't didn't mean propositional belief like when we speak of faith and belief we equate faith and belief and we say that faith is just you know um a blind sort of leap you know um yeah. faith uh fide, you know fides um pistis all the other equivalents in the other languages they all referred to um you know um uh, like an allegiance or commitment um uh, like to a vessel or to like a you know like a a person essentially you know like a that sort of thing right faithfulness um, and, yeah yeah exactly um so basically yeah that's what i'm trying to get at i'm trying i'm just trying to say that i think we need to retrieve the ancient sense of the compatibility of the harmony of faith and reason even if you don't consider yourself to be like christian or religious or you know, if you're atheist, for example, you like, you know, like being a or whatever, I don't really, it doesn't matter. I just think that this, you need to, I, I think it's important to retrieve the the ancient and pre-modern sense, uh, not directly retrieve, because, you know, you can't, um, can't do directly that. live in the past, right. you know. I mean, creatively yeah. retrieve that kind of, that harmony yeah. that, that they they thought of between faith and reason um, in a modern context, or post-modern context. Um, and I think that's probably one of the best ways to actually um, for people to come together and ultimately it'd be more harmony, you know, harmony together. But yeah, anyway, yeah. Say bye to Mira Scriptura. Yeah. To, thanks for coming in. Thank you. I don't you. know if you'll see this or not, but yeah. thanks for dropping your two cents in. Spartan, I'm going to kind of uh, let you. Um, yeah, I feel like I have like a different idea when it comes to this. I mean, so like for myself, I kind of like ride on the edge of like evangelical and like more whatever the other option is. I don't know what the word is. <laughs> I hate labels and whatnot, but That's I find over there. Yeah. Yeah. This like yeah. compartmentalizing idea is really, really interesting. I find that's like kind of what I do in a sense. Like, I think I agree with like, with Laura, like when you like it, I don't know. I think about it in like a number of ways, like, I can agree with, like, as we look at, like, okay, which letters did Paul write, for example, or whatever, and, like, at some point, you go back far enough, and they just, everybody was just 13, you know, I'm, and <laughs> now that's, like, just unheard of, essentially, 
and um but i still don't see like the theology changing like as much i don't seem like it's necessary to like i think it's important to like combine them at some point like samuel was saying like in a broader sense but in like the short term it seems like you're kind of asking two separate questions when you come to like textual criticism type stuff and like theological point that it's trying to make or whatever but that's just what my thoughts on that whole little conversation were but when it comes to like inerrancy something uh, we haven't touched on here and i think is important is like the weird sense that i feel like inerrancy and like like everyday christianity like it's like this uh like uh like a membership card or something like if you <laughs> if you can like affirm inerrancy okay you're a real christian you know you yep. affirm inerrancy but like you find somebody like they'll ask me and i'm like eh, i don't really like i don't like that term I, I i don't really hold to inerrancy and people like step back and like okay this guy's probably just you know he's not a real christian or whatever and i think that's like yeah right. yeah basically yeah. and i think it's like an important thing to touch on though because it's like a weird I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I just think that's something when it comes to inerrancy, that's like what comes to my mind. It's like immediately an argument, basically. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I. So I, I wonder, I don't know, Samuel, if you can comment on this. I wonder if it, it seems like inerrancy is sort of a, a gatekeeping thing mm -hmm. in American evangelicalism specifically. I don't know if you've run into that where you're at in New Zealand, but it, it seems like it's it's very much the sort of like you have to sign off on this or you're not involved in the in the church. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, I I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean I was just saying in the chat that, yeah, it's sort of like a boundary marker. Much like oh, circumcision yeah, or food. Yeah, much yeah, like yeah, yeah. the can you know how like <laughs> well, circumcision for the jews and like food laws was an issue in the early church you know in a similar way possibly to say about that um, <laughs> yeah yeah but no but, no keep yeah, going for yeah. sure whatever whatever you want to say that thing you know like all all religious communities have boundary markers right have i think specifically have ideological boundary markers and that you know yeah i think but, in but, yes you know, with inerrancy, I just want to say it's like weird how it's like a boundary marker that like you can mold to whatever in the world you want it to be, mm -hmm. which doesn't make any sense. It's like if you don't hold to inerrancy, you're a heretic. But if you like, oh, I hold to inerrancy, but I just believe that the message that it intends to teach is inerrant or whatever. I'm like, what in the world does that even mean? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you for saying that. But that's right. another that's a, a common way people talk about inerrancy. Like what's the, yeah. the one in the evangelical dictionary of theology is something like the autographs correctly interpreted and applied <laughs> into but it's like, it's <laughs> the documents we don't so have. you got autographs which don't exist. The, so the, a, the original, right? Yeah, so, the original. Yeah. So, I, well, that's what an autograph is. Yeah, so, like yeah. a hypothetical text, so the, if yeah. you interpret it correctly and principalize it yeah. out, to, yeah. So, it's, I love that idea. Yeah. By the way, <laughs> it's oh, if only we had the original version, we would be okay. <laughs> interpreted it right. So. Yeah. <laughs> I've only seen the version where it's about the original autographs. I haven't seen the as interpreted correctly. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's that, that's. I mean, there, there's so many layers that you know because yeah. guess what? You don't want what you don't want is that an error just to be right. That's what you don't want, right? So that's uh, that's the thing you're always trying to figure out. But, but that's but that's non falsifiable. A thing that we don't have is true. Yeah, I mean, you got it. <laughs> so. Great. Yep. In the Reformed tradition, uh, Reformed Christianity, you know, we we subscribe to the uh, Westminster Confession. So we have, <laughs> so we have, you affirm inerrancy, but the Westminster Confession defines all the doctrines that inerrancy would entail, like all the things you need to believe. But even with that, with that, there's all this debate. I can remember going to a Presbyterian meeting where, um, like the Westminster Confession says that God 
um, is without passion in the original, it's, or without emotion, and man, they the uh, potential pastors would just debate, no, that's not true, or the keeping of the Sabbath, they was, there was always an exception to that. So even within those traditions that are so rigid and firm, there's all this room to move around and disagree, and so inerrancy is like nailing, you know, pardon my language, but crap to a wall, it's just God drizzles God down. Say, that God got angry, a thing that the text literally says over yeah. and over again. Yeah, it has to be reinterpreted as something else because you have to avoid the emotional aspect. Why? Why do we have to do that? Why? Because God is unchanging. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's the because that's God that was is not character. embodied because Aristotle said so. <laughs> clearly. And he's an errant, last I checked. Yeah, but that's like really like as you let go of an errancy, you can like finally like read it for what it is and understand what it means you don't have to like you know maybe this like is like pushing against like some doctrine or you know like what you said about getting a god getting angry like maybe the person that wrote that text literally meant to write that god got angry you know what i mean and that's is what it is like we read read the, what it says for what it says and like and that's why like it's funny because as i'm like more willing to give this up i'm like uh, like I, I so when I first became a Christian, like I've never been a young Earth creationist, but I like first assumed that like okay, there must be a way to like really read this right that doesn't affirm young Earth creationism, and like now I, I'm like no, like the Bible says the Earth was created in six days, you know, like whatever. Maybe they thought that, maybe they didn't, maybe it's whatever. But like this is what it says. You don't have to like do what Hugh Ross does and like say that the, like what they actually meant was like millions of years and so like what are you talking about moses did not have any conception of millions of years if he wrote it or whoever did write it you know like they weren't thinking of these things we, you you don't have to like you just got to read it for what it is and that's what's been like very liberating but how to like i don't know how to square that with like sexual criticism and stuff and like faith and is a challenge but well, that's the beauty of inspiration is inspiration yeah. for me growing up. It was always um, whatever the authors had written down, whatever the apostle Peter had actually penned, whatever Moses had composed, there was this, the spirit of God behind it. So it could always mean something more than what the author had written. You know, the author didn't have to know exactly what he was saying. He could, he could write it down and then there'd be this superior revelation that maybe we wouldn't figure out till later down the road, you know, in 1900 or whatever. Um, you know, so there was always this, this potential for the text that inspiration provided to it, re regardless of reading it in context, of course, you know, um, but that's how we got around that. We could <laughs> creative interpretation. Yeah. I just said one thing to add to that. I, I think that, um, the recognizing what y you could call like the over determinacy of a text meaning um is in principle quite an important uh, quite an important one to to recognize actually so even if you you don't hold to like a um a rigid like literalist uh, so like a fundamentalist type of creative interpretation like some kind of i don't know a fundamentalist version of origins allegorically you know has allegorical <laughs> allegorical interpretation for example um, even if you don't hold to that, I think um, the idea behind the, the the principle, the idea behind like what origin and other um, allegorical interpretants in both Christian and other traditions we're trying to get at is just that you know there's an a, there's an over determinacy, an excess to the meaning of the text, which can't be pinned down to, you know to one uh, uh, univocal. Um, meaning um because uh, you know it depends what questions you ask the tech um what is your social location etc cetera, etc cetera. um so yeah I, I just think yeah um i guess i would wouldn't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater when it comes to like those um ancient inter methods of interpretation i think there's much value in them um if you interpret it in a kind of in a way that's um not you know, trying to violently impose your agenda on the text. You know, you, you sort of, um, but rather sort of um, humbly approaching the text. You know, um, how can, um, in my context, how how can I 
draw some meaning out of out of this, you know. Um, even would it like regardless of your religious or lack of religious persuasion, right? Yeah, I mean, there is a kind of modern bias against those sorts of interpretation that you were bringing up, uh, Samuel. <laughs> there really is, especially because of the sort of um, the dominance of higher criticism, which which has its own benefits um, in its own way. And I, I fully embrace those things in their sort of used in proper ways. But yeah, those things are going to be uh, kind of shut down pretty quickly. And I, I worry about that too. I do. I worry about those things being dismissed a bit too easily because I do think we're dealing with it. We're dealing with an ancient text, and like many ancient texts, those are going to be quite um, inexhaustible in their meanings. Um, yeah, so I think that's that's quite important for sure. Ben, I don't know if you have something to add there. Yeah, no, I I, I think that um, you know the with oral tradition, which you know, is it's such a nebulous term, but you, you, things yeah. change quite quickly and quite easily. But when you nail down a text, that's the text. But the person doesn't change. The interpreter is a fluid person. It, they they change from day to day. And so, you know, the moment you, I mean, I can look at one text one day and read one thing, and the next day I see something entirely different. Um, and, th and those two things could be diametrically opposed. I mean, so I think, you know, the 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 formation of a concrete text really set off this plurality of interpretations that I don't think oral tradition could ever accomplish. Um, no, yeah. So, you know, I, for better or for worse, of course, but um, yeah, writing it down, inscripturation for you, for lack of a better term, really, mm -hmm. really ramped up, her, you know, the hermeneutics, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I like this sort of emphasis on the uh, the interpreter reading a text, because as we know, when we're reading a text, um, whether or not we want to, uh, we're kind of going to get out of a text what we're bringing to it mm -hmm. in a certain sense. Not all the way through. It's not shot all the way through with our own presuppositions, but it's going to reflect something that we're bringing to it. The text is going to bounce back certain things that are different from what we're actually bringing to it. But that that's actually really important. I, I, I think that people forget that. <laughs> that, like, all of the stuff we're bringing to a text is going to be reflected um, in our readings. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, like, I, I like when people say, like, the plain reading of the text or whatever. Like, yeah, that, like, that what is, does that even... Like, <laughs> nonsensical term you could like it's ins it doesn't make any sense at all like and I, I i think about it too like people think like it's almost like people talk about like like you you're you probably become a christian before you ever read the bible i mean that's nobody like reads the whole bible and then sits down and is like all right now let me reflect on what okay. i read like yes. i mean yeah. you reflect as you read more than likely it wasn't even having anything to do with the bible it had to do with like a community of people you know so mm -hmm. and it's like impossible not to like you said it's impossible not to bring your presuppositions or like your worldview or whatever onto the text and i think just recognizing that is so important well, and just like being able good. to just be yeah. honest and, uh, yeah, and like exactly. are those good like is it is what i'm bringing to the text accurate and good or is it not like because when people ask, like, well, where do you see that in the text? Like, I could, I, like, in all reality, you can bend it and make it say basically whatever the world you want it to say. But is this, like, coherent and, you know, does it match with, like, is it the broader picture of things? That's where you can test. But, like, when, like, I, I'll see, like, these debates online, you know, and it's like, I mean, anybody can just find a bunch of text and yell at each other or whatever, but. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know exactly what I'm getting at, but well, yeah. the, the yeah. Apostle Paul does that. I mean, yeah, look at the way he interprets it. parts of Genesis. I mean, he in the in the Epistle to the Galatians, he talks about the seed being Christ and and the, and the seed of Abraham. And you you read Genesis and you're like, where is Paul? Wait, what is going on here? 
what is Paul reading? But he's interpreted everything Christologically. He's brought yeah, this to yeah, the yeah. table and he's brought it to bear on the text. Yeah. Sarah and Hagar and uh Yeah, the allegory what are you Paul are you, what are you smoking? It's, it's insane stuff. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like the rock oh, that the water or whatever is yeah. right. <laughs> and it's like if if that wasn't in the New Testament and I told you like, oh, I was reading the Old Testament, and I actually realized <laughs> that this rock is Good Jesus. Luck getting it out People would look at me like I'm insane. Yeah. It's exactly. Yeah. It's exactly right. Oh, like lacking in imagination. <laughs> yeah. you know, um... It's true. It's true. Laura, you know that cards, by the way. Um, she's getting a little sleepy uh, <laughs> after a full day of doing much more difficult things than I do. Uh, <laughs> writing her dissertation and, and all that. Oof. Yeah. But um yeah, I just want to thank you guys for for coming on and um, yeah, I don't know if y'all have any final words about what is the Bible. What do you want to leave people with? Someone can <laughs> go first. Anyone? Not everyone at once. No, I appreciate this conversation though, and I want to say like thank you, Avi, because that was really interesting to hear your perspective. And mm -hmm. like, I feel like I definitely like learned Avi, a little bit. Avi, we need to have you on like all the time at a moment here. It's an encyclopedia. I just, I just like you're, talking, you're the dude. Yeah, and you have um, the best bookshelf behind you. I love this bookshelf. Um, <laughs> I really like what Ben said earlier about the Bible being a library. Mm -hmm. um, so Ben quoted that of Fredrickson. Yep. Um, I like it academically. Um, William Prop said this. Um, William Prop wrote the Anchor Bible on Exodus. Um, and somewhere, I think it's on somewhere on the SBL site, he says like, look, I study the library of ancient Israel and Judah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's, the Bible, as it's always, always, always dogmatic, whoever is saying it, um, and to just say, look, I'm not even studying that. I'm studying the Library of Ancient Israel and Judah is very refreshing. Um, it's obviously, it's, it's impossible, um, but it's helpful to at least start with that. Um, that's not what the Bible is to me, but that's still developing, so. Mm. <laughs> Anyone else? Final words? Yeah, I, I would one. just... Oh, go ahead, Samuel. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, well, one time final thought I just had was kind of continuing what I was just saying a little bit earlier about um, resisting that, that compartmentalizing mentality. Um, is that... Um, I've been reading um, the Muslim Sufi writer Ibn Arabi recently, and he, he talks about how there's two eyes of interpreted. You have the, the eye of reason, akal in that Arabic, the eye of imagination, um, which is um, kayal in Arabic. Um, and I, I, I think that um, that distinction, uh, sorry, that, yeah, the dialectic between imagination and reason is um, quite an important one to be aware of um, when it comes to, um, well, interpreting the world in general, reality in general, but also just in particular, when it comes to, you know, seeing the relation between faith, uh, sorry, between biblical criticism and a life of faith or uh, that sort of thing. Right? Um, because I, I, I think um, that, um, this is obviously my personal belief, um, people don't necessarily have to agree, but I think that once you do maintain those two in a proper balance, I think that you do find um, that um, uh, like a disciplined imagination has the capacity to perceive God's revelation in um, what Ibn Arabi calls the three books. So you have the, the book of, um, this is kind of an extension of the Augustine's two books um, in a sense. So you have the three books, you have the, um, the book of the, um, the cosmos, the book of scripture, which and would have been the, the Quran, and then the book of the soul, the the you know the the, the self, right? Um, yeah, and so I, I think if you overemphasize like reason, for example, 
um, I think that you can, people can actually fail to see how how the divine or the infinite, whatever you want to call it, reveals itself in those three books. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas I think if you over focus on the if you over focus on the imagination, you have a kind of you know fantastic mythological um, kind of fundamentalist religion, you know, which you know is pretty much just a projection of yourself. You know. <laughs> You know, so you don't have any reason, rationality to it. You know, you have, you, you just, it's just sort of like, well, um, Trumpist religion, really. Um, you know, um, <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, that's just a final thought I had, just based on what I've been reading recently. So, yeah. Spartan, any final thoughts? No worries if you don't, but yeah. No, I just appreciate you having me on. Yeah, I think this is a really important, yeah. but in a fun conversation. So, I yeah. guess so, yeah. I'll close things out by kind of giving my two cents on how I think about the, the Bible and maybe y'all can um, find something to agree with uh, in this. <laughs> I really, really like thinking about the Bible in all, I mean, I love the library kind of account of it. I think that's really helpful, but I think it's more dynamic than that. I think there is something about the Bible that is quite living um, even if we're not religious, um, specifically, I think that the way that I think about the Bible is almost like stepping into like a beautiful sort of botanical garden where you have different doors that go into different places. You can open up a, a big rusty door to a desert, right? In Mexico, journey into it, see what's going on there. You can go into the jungles. You can see what's going on there. There's flowering and for flourishing sort of going on there. Um, that it's really about sort of seeing all this living stuff going on that we're feeling and sensing and being a part of. Um, one of the things about I, I haven't men mentioned Carl Bart yet, but I'm going to. That he <laughs> talks about the strangeness of the Bible, the strange world of this text that we're stepping into. There is this weirdness that we're involved in. Always. Right? There is a kind of oddness to it. Um, to these different rooms that we're um, given access to. And I, I think regardless of w whether we have religious commitments or not, um, I think we can appreciate that. There are different rooms that we're a part of, different rooms that we can step into, that we can learn from. Um, so that's kind of what I would say about the Bible. I think it, it, it's just this wonderful, rich, flowering, growing, dynamic reality um, that everyone can be a part of. So that's what I would say, yeah. Thanks everyone for being a part of this. Really appreciate it. Laura, yeah. appreciation to you too. And yeah, Ben, Avi, Ethan, Samuel, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, it's nice to meet you. This, meet you too. Yeah. Ben and Avi. Yep. Nice to meet you all face to face. We'll have you all back, of course. Okay. Samuel, we've had you on. Ethan, we've had you on way too many times. <laughs> um, <laughs> Avi, yes, thank you. And with that, this has been Apocalypse Here, Christianity You Can Live With. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>